Yes, thank you, um, Eric, Andy, Andrea, for in inviting us to, to speak. Um, this is going to be a highly collaborative. Which, so, so Nevan, uh, I have to ask you a question. Work. Nevan, I have to ask you a question. So the, the talks are going to be 25 minutes each. So should I give you a two-minute warning, or is it going to be integrated, and is a total of the combined time? I think, I think the, the best thing is to give us questions at the very end after we jointly speak. Right, but should Andrea, I give you a reminder okay. that uh, Adolfo's time is coming up? So will I give you a reminder of 23 minutes? No, because we're going back and forth. We're actually okay. going back and forth, so maybe just at the end. If, if, okay, I don't think so I'll give you a reminder. Let, then and I think four. it will be fine. I don't think we will go over time. I think okay, it'll be very short. Good. So I'll give you a reminder of 44. Okay, bye. So thanks, guys, for in, inviting us. Uh, and thanks for people um, tuning in. Um, so as I said, it's a very collaborative project that's been going on the last few months, and we're going to see a very collaborative uh, talk and um, Adolfo is going to start. I'm going to progress the slides and if I don't like what Adolfo is saying, I can go to the next slide. Yeah, and also you're going to point to the place in the slides that I like to, to show, right? <laughs> okay, so this is going to okay, be a, a nice good. experiment together, Nevan. Uh, so um, we are going to talk about some of the collaborative studies that we have been doing between our laboratories and also involve many other ones. And the way how this is going to work is I'm going to start, then Nevan is going to continue, then I'm going to continue, then Nevan is going to get back, and that's the reason why it's that. But, but have in mind that there are many other people that have been involved in these studies, and we will mention some of them as we go along. Uh, and just the image that you see here is a virus cell that is infected with SARS coronavirus 2, and you see in red the nucleoprotein, and in green the AC2 receptor. And um, thank you, Nevan, for passing the slide. <laughs> go ahead, go on the slide. Thank you. This is slide, Nevan. Thank you. Uh, so I just will start with uh, with uh, you know what what is believed to be right now um, what uh, the determinants of disease during. COVID-19. Uh, this has come from a from a, um, a review that was uh, written um, recently uh, by people in, in Harvard. And basically, this is based on what we know also from other inflammatory diseases um, in, in, the, in the lung caused by viral infections, as well as by some of the data that is now available from, from human infections. So that uh, it, during um, very severe disease with, uh, with uh, SARS coronavirus 2, it looked like they are um, three stages. The first one is early infection where the virus starts to replicate and there is a, there is viruses that is shedding uh, and there is a viral response uh, phase but at this advance it becomes now more involvement of the lung, uh, most likely the, the virus going from the upper respiratory tract to the lower respiratory tract uh, where uh, now you start to have more pulmonary type of symptoms and uh, hypoxia type of symptoms and then the, the people that really go into severe disease it looks like there is a, a enhanced inflammatory response, uh, but I think uh, still there is a lot that we need to understand between what is caused really by hyperinflammation and what is caused by failure of the lung to uh, exchange oxygen, and this resulting also in some of the other um, uh, uh, symptoms, severe symptoms, and I think probably will be a combination between both things, the hypoxia events that they are also going to make a lot of uh, problems in other organs, as well as uh, the hyperinflammation in several places, some of them that has been uh, uh, proposed is the endothelium. Okay, so can we, can we go for the next one? And I th I think I just will start with uh, um, some studies that we did early on. This is in collaboration with Viviana Simon here in Mount Sinai on what we know about shedding of, of the virus. Um, and that's a typical shedding that you find. Um, uh, that was a, a person that came to Sinai in, uh, uh, three, uh, in April, April 3. Or, uh, April 3, and then um, you can see that uh, when he was uh, uh, coming to Sinai with, with the same primers that this has been used by the, by the CDC, the first ones that they were used, uh, so different set of primers, you can see similar viral loads with all the three primers, uh, how uh, in the beginning there is high levels of, of, of viruses uh, as, as measured by genomic uh, copies in the, in the nose of, of, of this patient and how it's going, it's going down uh, with time. The, here, the treatment that was done was hydroxychloroquine, um, and then uh, uh, it was uh, the limit of detection. It was stopping shedding viruses uh, around uh, a little bit more than, than one week, uh, uh, more or less. And some people, they shed more times, and people shed less time, but that's a typical uh, shedding pattern in, in, in people infected with uh, SARS coronavirus 2 when they come to the hospital uh, because of the symptoms that they're getting. Okay, can I get the next slide? 
Uh, now, what, what we see in these patients, and this is something that we, we are conducting together with the Human Immunitary Corps in, the, in, um, in Sinai, Miriam Merat uh, and Avid uh, at Adib, uh, they are uh, responsible of this core. And this is just an example of uh, what we see in the blood of, of people that are infected with COVID-19, uh, especially those that they come to the hospital and they get more severe infection. And what, what is shown in here is, uh, is a site of, meaning uh, we are looking for the different types of, uh, uh, and, and Nevan, you, can you put this bigger? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, the different types of cells that we find by um, uh, immunophenotyping using uh, a site of in antibodies uh, and a mass spec to, uh, to look to different types of, of cells and using the healthy control you, you find all these different cells with large amount in blood of CD4 T cells uh, and also B cells and I think what is very clear in people that have COVID-19 and these are three different uh, two patients uh, at baseline when they came and then at day three and day seven uh, in one of the patients, the one that is in the bottom, there was already uh, almost no T cells and not B cells in blood, so a lot of lymphopenia, uh, and uh, that continued during the during the course of disease. In the other patient, there was a starting with relatively good levels of T cells and B cells. By day three, they started to have lower numbers, and by day seven, really lower. So. One, one of the hallmarks of this disease is this lymphopenia that happens in blood that uh, uh, is either due to uh, apoptotic death of the cells or just the cells migrating into tissues and then being depleted from, from, from blood. Uh, so we see this T and B cell depletion and there is also what is an indication of regeneration of classical monocytes and we are uh, now pending of, cyt of cytokine profile. And uh, can I have uh, the next one? And the other studies that we are conducting is in autopsies in bronchial alveolar lavages and biopsies together with different people here in Sinai. Um, can I have the next slide, Neva? Uh, one of the things that we have been working on, and, and you know this, uh, I thought that it would be interesting to show it, is uh, people are very interested in conducting measurements outside BSL-3, and, and they are very uh, worried uh, to, for contamination with viruses, if, uh, even if they are not amplification of viruses, so that uh, they, they are allowed to be used in BSL-2+. plus. So for that, we have spent some time in looking how to inactivate uh, samples in uh, in uh, either in uh, serum or which usually you don't find infectious viruses but there is always the possibility of some or in bronchial alveolar lavages which is there you can find uh, more more amount of viruses and what we have done is we take zero or, or bronchial alveolar lavages from people that are not infected spike them with viruses with real viruses and then we have used uh, either detergent treatment with triton which uh, is a mild treatment that will not prevent cytokine measurements for example or with uh, UV um, irradiation, which again, I will not prevent cytokine measurements later on. And uh, as you can see, it's a little bit more difficult to um, eliminate it from, from serum, probably because the protein concentration is higher, but UV works relatively quite well, bringing down three locks, the titus, uh, after 60 minutes of UV radiation. Uh, while in bronchoabellar fluids, lavages, uh, this is more easy to inactivate, uh, both by detergent treatment as well as by uh, UV radiation. Can I have the next slide? Uh, and now I, I, th I, I thought that I will show you some of the data that, uh, that, that we are, I think uh, now they are in print, um, which uh, follows up some of the early studies that we conducted here, Viviana and uh, mainly Viviana and Harm, uh, looking to uh, uh, people that were infected with COVID-19 and what is the sequence of this virus or the phylogenetical uh, relationships. So Viviana is uh, here in, in macrobiology, is having a program now for more than four years in which uh, we are collecting uh, from people that have respiratory disease, the nasal swabs and then been banking them and uh, they get diagnosed or they don't get diagnosed, but we are still banking them. And uh, for, for influenza, we are um, sequencing viruses that are in the community and also looking what are the levels of circulation of influenza viruses based on the patients that come to Mount Sinai. And, uh, and as you can see, uh, the influenza season uh, started around December, where you started to see some uh, uh, cases in, in Sinai of both influenza A and influenza B. 
and then it went with a peak around January and February and then it started to decline in March. And it was in March when we started to see when the diagnostics was implemented for COVID-19 and we started to see the cases of COVID-19 and you can see how quickly they, they started to uh, increase and, and how now influenza is not uh, anymore uh, spreading at least uh, significantly uh, and that's this is just based on, on Mount Sinai samples and around March 18 is starting to, to become exponential. So in gray what you have in there, they are, um, they are um, positive nasal swaps uh, for COVID-19 um, that came to Sinai early on when there was not still not so much diagnostic uh, 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 known spreading of the virus and uh, these uh, these, these nasal swaps, they have been sequenced by, uh, for the virus for, uh, by Harm Van Bakel uh, using the clinical specimen without viral amplification in, in cells. So we get the actual sequence uh, of, of the virus that is in the clinical specimen. Because uh, sometimes if you put in cells, it may change the slightly sequence to poor cell adaptation. Can I have the next slide? And there, there was a total of around uh, 90 um, cases that they were sequenced. And what you see here is a phylogenetic tree. And in red, the, the, the points that you see in red are this, the virus that were sequenced in Sinai. Uh, in blue, you see viruses that they were sequenced uh, also in New York by other groups. And the rest are viruses that are from all the different, different parts of the world. And this again is from February 29 to March 18 in, in New York, the red dots and the blue dots. So what you can see is that the, the majority of the red dots are there upper uh, in the upper one, which they are the clade, one of the biggest clade for the virus, uh, what they are called uh, clade A2A. We you see also some um, lines with, uh, with different colors. This, this reflect what is the region where these clades are circulating. So what the viruses come from in, in other parts of the world. And you see that the majority of, of these red dots are together with uh, the, the, the green lines, which are viruses, so they are phylogenetically related to the viruses that are in Europe. You see also this gray line where there are a lot of red dots. This is an indication of viruses that are very similar in sequence, so that's an indication of community, local community spreading of the same virus within the community, and that's how you see, uh, that is highlighted here with this arrow. But you see also some other red dots around, and you see that they are representative isolates that seem phylogenetically related, not only to, to European viruses, but also to Chinese viruses, to Iranian viruses, to uh, Australian viruses. Can I get the, the next slide? And if we look to these very individual dots, um, these, um, these are uh, viruses that probably they were introduced at the moment that we sequence it. So uh, the, the European isolates, the, the ones that are, uh, these ones that are close to the European isolates, but far, far away, from the ones that are uh, more abundant. Uh, the most likely accent as, as centers came uh, from late February. Um, the same thing with the ASEAN virus uh, that we have there. March 3, this, the Washington, the so West Coast introduction. March 3, and a direct import case here, uh, we knew because the person came from Iran in February 29 from Iran. Can I get the next slide? But the interesting thing is that this, this threat, the, the majority of them, if you look to infer origin, it's around January 25, and they come uh, mo uh, fr most likely from Europe based on phylogenetic analysis. So that means that uh, the virus was introduced already in New York as early as January 25, most likely coming from Europe. Can I get the next? Now, if we look when the travel restrictions coming into this country, uh, there was close borders for China, for Iran, and then later on from, from European countries. Uh, but it came too late. So by the time that it was closed the borders to China, there is already evidence, phylogenetic evidence, that the virus was circulating already in New York, um, early ancestor January 25, and actually not coming directly from China, but uh, coming through Europe, most likely from China to Europe and Europe circulation, and then coming, coming to New York from Europe. Um, so so that, that illustrates how fast this virus uh, spreads, and how it, it caught the whole world, uh, basically, with we are up uh, in surprise and uh, and when the, when the restrictions are coming they were already probably too late to uh, at least just uh, prevent the seeding of the virus in in the places where now there have been more outbreaks can i get the next uh now the, this is how this the next is steps that they were taking closing the schools non-essential services etc and that was at the, at the time that probably there was already a lot of infections and that was I make very difficult to control um, the, the number of severe cases by um, the distance, social distancing and confinement. 
can I have the next slide? And by the way, the pandemic was declared by WHO March 11. And, and again, this illustrates that this was already quite well spread, uh, but we didn't notice because there was not enough diagnostic at this time. At the next slide. So basically here is, um, again, the graphic that I saw with Monsignor cases, and that's where contention measures were taken. Uh, but actually, can I have next slide? What most likely happened is that there were a lot of undetected infections at this time, and that uh, actually by the time that they were taking contention measures, there was already a lot of circulation, so it has, taken, it has been harder to contain the number of cases due, uh, due to this fact. All right. Now, um, next, I'm going to switch a little bit, and I'm going to talk uh, about more of the collaborative studies that we have done with, uh, with Nevan and, and a lot of people, and uh, we will go along that, which is... Uh, have to do with which host factors are important for virus replication and pathogenesis, and can we use this information to try to come out with rational approaches to find therapies that can be applied immediately for the treatment of infection. Can I have the next slide, Neva? So this is uh, how the virus uh, is replicates, thanks to Susan Weiss for providing with this uh, slide, and uh, you see that the virus enters through the receptor, which is believed to be AC2, as we know, and that uh, there is replication in the cytoplasma and at the end is budding of the viruses. I'm not gonna go in detail about how this thing happens, but basically what I want to illustrate here, can I have the next uh, uh, slide, is that during this replication, the virus is gonna require host factors in order to be able to replicate and to co-opt these factors for making of the cell a factory of viruses. And then can I have the next slide? And at the same time, it's going to need to deal with uh, recognition by the cell that there is virus infection, induction of antiviral factors, and then in order to be able to survive in an infected cell, every virus needs also to somehow hamper these antiviral factors in order to produce in that viruses. And, they, and we think that by knowing what are these factors, uh, both antiviral and required factors, we can come out with some ways, uh, some rational ways to establish uh, therapies. Uh, okay. Can I have the next slide? So we know already that there are several um, therapies that are in clinical studies. Hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine have shown uh, uh, not too much promise, but still uh, has been proposed to be, uh, um, and they have certainly antiviral activity ex vivo. Remdesivir is one of the ones that seems now to be more uh, promoted because of the data that is coming with remdesivir. Uh, also, plasma from convalescent individuals is trying to be used, and others. These first, these first ones, they are related to inhibit viral replication, but there is also some therapies that they are to suppress the immune response, and I think that's also a valid, uh, a valid thing, especially for the latest cases of, 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 of disease. But what I'm going to concentrate now, and what we're going to go through, is the studies that we have done together um, about how to look for antivirals, uh, but within drugs that are already used in humans uh, with non-toxicity PK and variability properties, so what is called repurposing usage of drugs. And, but we, uh, in the case with we, the studies we've done with Nevan, we didn't go to do a, a, a high throughput screen of all these drugs. Uh, the drugs that they were, they were chosen according to predictions that they were established through the studies that they were done by Nevan on protein-protein interactions. So this allows to reduce the number of drugs that you tested, and we have been testing the for inhibition and replication in tissue culture. The ones that are giving us a good result, a good impact, uh, that there's, then they're going to be the ones that are moving also to animal models. But it's, it's good that some of them are already starting clinical trials. So, so again, the idea here is uh, finding um, host factors that are likely to participate in viral infection, and then looking what drugs target these host factors and then test these drugs in an in vitro replication assay in order to move forward in, in vivo, especially because most of these drugs have already been clinically approved for other indications. Can I have the next slide? So then the, the question here is, can we identify compounds that inhibit host factors involved in sars coronavirus 2 replication among non-human drugs based on this approach? Can I have the next slide? And this is my cue. I never appears here. This is my cue to get now the, the, the seminar going to Nevan. And uh, you, you can see him here, and it's, uh, it's up to you now, Nevan. Okay. All right. Thank you, Adolfo. Um, so, what I'm going to tell you about is um, some efforts that have been ongoing at UCSF, in particular, in the context of this recently formed QCRG, the QBI COVID 19 or coronavirus um, uh, research group. 
And it actually started with 22 different laboratories associated with QVI, and then it is, it's expanded over uh, the last month or so to 41 different laboratories. And it involves hundreds of different scientists, essentially, in all these different labs. And I would say that, you know, at least at UCSF, uh, the scientists have come together in a very unprecedented way uh, to try to tackle this uh, pandemic. And in this group, we have not just systems biologists, but structural biologists, chemical biologists, computational scientists, and virologists. And we're all trying to bring our tools to the table and work together in an integrative way to come up with solutions to this particular um, pandemic. And you know, the Zoom calls got so large, we've actually broken these up into different subgroups that are focused on different biological areas as well as technological areas as well. And just to point out one group here, which I'm very excited about, I'm actually excited about all of them, but the structural biology group, which is a big strength of UCSF, led by Clem Verba and Oren Rosenberg. And we've got a big team now that's digging deep um, biochemically and biophysically and structurally with all the protein-protein interactions that um, we have ultimately um, uh, uncovered. And this is a paper that was published uh, earlier uh, this month, um, uh, which, as Adolfo was saying, uh, describes our SARS-CoV um, human protein-protein interaction map and, and how we're using it to come up with drugs or compounds and uh, to see if they have any uh, antiviral effects in the context of this uh, a drug repurposing uh, pipeline. There's over 120 authors on this paper. Uh, and we really had to get all these people together, in my opinion, to move as fast um, as we did. So this is just kind of a, I guess, a extension of Stanley's uh, presentation. And for my mind, it's not that big of a surprise we're actually in this particular pandemic, right? We've dealt with SARS-1, early 2000. There's been a MERS outbreak. As Stanley said, MERS is still ongoing at a much lower uh, a spread, obviously. Um, but in these cases of SARS and MERS, the mortality rate is much higher, but it's a lot less infectious than SARS-CoV-2. And I think this is the biggest problem here with SARS-CoV-2. It's much more infectious, and the majority of people seemingly are asymptomatic. So in that regard, it's, it's almost impossible to stop the spread of SARS-CoV-2, or at least incredibly difficult. And uh, this is just a tra trajectory to remind people we'll probably be dealing with a COVID-24 or COVID-28. So the, the logic here is to let's get our act together now so we can be more prepared as a scientific community to deal with uh, future uh, pandemics. So as Adolfo was saying, um, we're taking a different tact here. We're looking at the host with respect to drug development. There's a lot of work ongoing trying to find drugs and compounds to attack viral proteins. We're looking at the host proteins that the virus needs in order to optimally infect our cells. And there's advantages with this tact. We don't have to worry so much about uh, a resistance because we don't mutate as fast um, as uh, the viruses. Um, and what we and others have noticed is that um, viruses, and seemingly very different viruses, actually attack similar host machinery. So the, the logic here is if we could come up with a host-directed therapy for COVID-19, it could be applicable to COVID-22, COVID-24, and other viral infections as well. And right? so these are some advantages. Obviously, some disadvantages here if you're talking to host, you have to maybe worry a little bit more about toxicity. But since we're initially focused on FDA-approved drugs, and uh, compounds in clinical trials, many of which have passed the toxicity threshold, the, the goal here would be, would be uh, less problematic with respect to, to toxicity. So the virus has about 30 genes um, compared to you know, over 20,000 genes and proteins that are in each one of our cells. So the virus by itself, it needs our gene genes in order to live and replicate and infect our cells. So the project here is to try to identify in an unbiased way all the proteins that the virus needs in order to optimally infect our cells through a protein-protein interaction study. We've identified over 300 uh, proteins and then narrowed in on um, druggable targets. So there's about uh, 66 of these in this initial look at the, the proteomics, which our collaborators, um, Kevin Shokat and Brian Shokat, narrowed in on and identified uh, initially uh, 69 different drugs and compounds that we wanted to test to see if it has any antiviral activity. And just to go a little bit more detail into this, so generated a protection map. Um, and this map is not just fueling drug repurposing studies, but as I alluded to before, it's generating a lot of hypotheses with respect to biochemistry and structural analysis, a lot of work with respect to kind of discovery research around chemical biology, and then a lot of bioinformatic analysis. And one of our goals here is to integrate all this information together to find key proteins, key complexes, key pathways that we think the virus needs so that we can genetically and pharmacologically inhibit it and see what effects it has in infection experiments that are being done by Adolfo and others. And then in a reiterative way, the, the information from these ex infection experiments can then reinform this experimental and computational um, pipeline. 
So this type of approach we've actually done many times um, over the last 10 years, focused on a number of different viruses, including HIV and enteroviruses, Ebola, dengue, and Zika. And normally these maps, they take you know, at least a year, year and a half to generate. Well, we generated this particular map in a matter of weeks. And to me, that's a testament to the collaborative spirit that went into this particular uh, project. We didn't have time to wait to generate this map. And in fact, the last data that came off the mass spec for this map uh, was the same day that UCSF implemented a, a, a campus-wide shutdown. So we got this data just in time. And of course, then remotely we've been analyzing it and working with collaborators around the world, as you'll hear. So uh, I think we were the first group to clone out each one of these genes one at a time. Uh, we got them synthesized. Um, and there's some debate on the exact number. We tried to you know, be um, generous in terms of assigning what we thought was a gene or an ARF. So there's 16 non-structural proteins, four structural proteins, and then nine, which we thought uh, accessory proteins. So we got these synthesized, got these affinity tag. Here's a Western blot showing expression of the majority um, of these. And initially what we did was, as we've done in other cases, express these in HEC293 cells, lysed the cells, purified the proteins. It's using a strep tag, a 2X strep tag on each one of the viral proteins, and then used mass spectrometry to identify co-purifying human proteins. And then using algorithms that we and others have developed over the years, we came up with a, a high confidence, high quality SARS-CoV-2 human protein-protein interaction map. And when we initially put this paper on BioArchive, I just tweeted out to say, look, we got all these genes cloned. If anybody wants these, we're happy to send them. No MTA, we'll pay for shipping. Feel free to distribute as much as you want. And over a couple of weeks, we actually sent these plasmids to over 300 labs. I think it's over 350 labs now in 40 different countries. I think one of these, a couple of these dots are Columbia's, uh, Columbia. I think one of these dots corresponds to Rod Rostein, now who's working on these viral proteins in yeast. But to me, it was great to, for us to be able to help the scientific community at large help expedite research on uh, SARS-CoV-2. So here's the map that we uh, initially generated, 332 SARS-CoV human protein-protein interactions, including 16 different druggable targets. The red diamonds correspond to the viral proteins. The, the circles correspond to human proteins. If it's a potential drug target, it's in orange. And I just wanted to point out, we collaborated with this um, company called Zoic Labs. It's actually in Hollywood and it's involved in helping make movies. Uh, they took our data and they made it in a very interactive way, a very intuitive way. And I'd encourage if people are interested in this data to go to our paper and go to this particular link. It's actually been looked at now by scientists, um, several thousand scientists in 87 different countries as of uh, a couple of days ago. So we've been doing a lot of global analysis with this data set, comparing it to GoOntology, PFAM, tissue expression, other data sets that we and others are generating in the context of infection, and then doing comparative work across different um, uh, viral uh, networks. I just wanted to show you one analysis which I thought was interesting. This was uh, spearheaded by Pedro Beltreo. He's a professor at e EBI EMBL in Cambridge. So what he did was just simply took all 332 proteins and looked across all tissues, all human tissues, to see which tissue has these 332 human proteins most highly expressed. And in an unbiased way, he found that they're most highly expressed as a group in lung. Even though we're connecting the, collecting this data in kidney cells, HEC293 cells, it's most highly expressed in lung. And this gave us confidence that we've identified hopefully a high confident physiologically relevant data set. Although we are generating this data in a number of different cells or tissues um, uh, right now. And one of our goals was obviously to identify drugs and compounds for repurposing, but another major goal is just to really try to understand the underlying biology at a deep mechanistic level of how SARS-CoV comes into our cells and hijacks and rewires them during the course of infection. And this is just one example. This is uh, from uh, the gross lab that we're working with. We found one of the ORFs here, this little guy, ORF10, physically associated with a colon-containing ubiquitin ligase complex. It's a COL2 complex involved in the ubiquitination and regulation of a number of different proteins in the host. We found the adapter ZIG11B for COL2. Uh, and what was great is we've already been on this complex for over 10 years because it's being hijacked by uh, another, H uh, another viral protein, an HIV protein. We've been collaborating with John Gross on this front. So we had these tools in place, and John initially predicted where ORF10 could be binding to this adapter. Uh, I think now we're going to have a structure of this very soon, and we're looking globally at ubiquitination to see what effects ORF10 is having on the COL2 complex. But just to show you, we're using this map to go deep mechanistically on a number of different um, fronts. So predictions that we generated. Um, and at the time, we didn't have the virus propagating in the Bay Area. We actually still don't have it robustly propagating, although efforts from Mel and Yon at the Gladstone, we're going to have it soon. 
But it was great that we had these fantastic collaborations around the world that could test our predictions and could test our drugs and compounds, including investigators at the Institute Pasteur, uh, in particular Marco Vignuzzi and Olivia Schwartz and Christoph have been great. And then of course, uh, been working with Adolfo for many, many years on a variety of different viruses. Uh, and so we've got a great relationship with him and he's been able to uh, test a number of our drugs and compounds. So there's a picture of Adolfo, so now that means it goes back to Adolfo. Okay, back to me. Thank you, Nevan. Uh, can I get the next slide? So just, just to emphasize what Nevan was saying, um, based on this protein-protein uh, interaction map that, uh, that uh, he, was, he was able to obtain so quickly, um, and in collaboration with uh, some great chemical bioinformaticians and chemi organic chemical people, uh, Kevin and Brian. Uh, Kevin and Brian came out with different drugs, different compounds that are known to target some of these uh, proteins that are in the protein-protein interacting map. And uh, this one, these compounds were sent to my lab, they were sent to a Paris lab, and uh, now all, this, all of these uh, drugs that they were identified there, now we have all tested, and then uh, some of them have a very interesting um, antiviral activity, and that was tested in an antiviral replication assay for the virus in, in my lab, was mainly done by Chris White uh, with the help of Lisa Miorin and Elena Moreno. Can I have next slide? And, and the acid that we, that we use is something that we put uh, quickly based also on an antiviral acid we have already running for influenza viruses. Um, and that's based on the seeding cells where the virus replicates well. In this case, they are virus 6 cells, which are some of the best uh, cells for replicating viruses. And that's the reason why we use these cells. And we seed them into um, 96 well plates. And then we treat them uh, before uh, infection, two hours before infection with the drug. Then we infect with SARS coronavirus 2, and thus uh, we do the NMOI of 0 0.025 uh, viruses uh, per, per cell. In Paris, they do a very similar assay, but a little bit higher MOI. And uh, then we keep the infection in the presence of the compound. And 48 hours later, this we do all in the infections in BSL3. 48 hours later, we, uh, fix, uh, we fix the cells before aldehyde, inactivate the viruses, take it out of the BSL-3, and now looking for viral replication. We also take the viral supernatans and stay it in the BSL-3 for measuring viral infections. And we use a slightly different um, approaches about how to measure viral replication in, in my lab and in the Institute Pasteur. In, in, in my lab, we stain these cells that have been infect, infected for 48 hours with an antibody against SARS coronavirus 2. It's against the end protein of the virus. We're lucky enough that we have this antibody from an antibody that we generated a, a while ago in 2005 against SARS coronavirus 1 that cross react with the nucleoprotein, pro the nucleoprotein of SARS coronavirus 2. So we have this acid to be able to be quantified thanks to this, this antibody that we have uh, already available. And this tells us the number of infected cells. And based on the number of infected cells, we establish the antiviral activity of these compounds. Uh, the ones that they look very promising, uh, we also do a, a TCID50 from the supernatans to see what is the reduction of viral replication. And in Paris, they use, instead of using a staining with an, with a, with an um, antibody staining, they measure replication by looking to uh, genomes by uh, quantitative RT-PCR. And again, if they get something uh, that is, looks promising, they do a plaque assay very similar to a TCID-50. Okay, can I have next slide? So th these are actually the, the plaque assays that we also implemented here, the in vivo cells. They, they make these very nice plaques, so it's very easy to quantify. You have the right type of cells, uh, the, the number of infectious viruses that you have. Can I have the next slide? Well, and now I'm going to summarize some of the interesting uh, things that we found. Uh, we specifically found some uh, themes among the antivirals that we identified through, this, through these assays. Uh, and in general, they came two major type of antivirals that we found, one that are, are related to inhibitors of host proteins that are uh, involved in protein translation or biogenesis. And uh, these are SOTA typhine and ternatine uh, for also uh, with the drug that has been used in clinical trials, uh, not in clinical trials, it's been used for the treatment of uh, uh, multiple myeloma plitidepsin. And, uh, but the, the, I think the most surprising thing is that we found all this group of drugs that are all Sigma R1 and Sigma R2, Sigma receptor modulators, 
uh, that involve uh, many different types of drugs. Some are antihistamines, some are antimalarials like hydroxychloroquine that is working also in SASE and also targets this sigma receptor. Uh, hormones uh, like progesterone, some hormones that are clinical, some anti-anxiety, some antipsychotics, all of them, they inhibit uh, the replication of the virus and all of them have in common that they are targeting the sigma R1 and sigma R2 receptors. Can I have the next slide? Uh, so, so this is an example of how uh, these, these proteins, they are interacting with proteins, with host proteins that are involved in RNA processing and, and, and several of the, of, the pack of the different host pathways that they are targeting. And some of them, as you can see, they are involved in, in protein biogenesis. And that's the reason why we, we became interested in protein biogenesis. Next slide. And among the ones that are involved in protein biogenesis, they are the ones that uh, in, interact either with uh, elongation initiation factor uh, EEIF1 or uh, elongation factor 4A. Uh, the ternatin targets one of these uh, elongation factors, and both in our assay and the assay in Paris, they give us nice antiviral activities in our assay. Uh, here in New York, we look for uh, different um, uh, concentrations of the compound, at different concentrations, we look for the ability to inhibit. So starting with high concentrations, going to low concentrations, and that the different dots that you see in these red curves. And as you can see with ternatine 4, we get nice inhibition of viral replication in terms of number of infected cells, almost to zero, um, using a, a concentration that is reasonably good in the macromolar, less than macromolar range. Uh, while there is some cytotoxicity, as you can see in the, in the black uh, curve, this, uh, this stops at 50%. And we know that that's what it's the effect of cytostatic drugs, because uh, the, the, in the absence of the drug, the cells that are not infected, they continue growing up, so we have more cells, and it looks like there is 50% less cells. Uh, it's not that 50% of the cells get killed, it's that 50% of the cells are remaining, they have not grown in the presence of the drug. So we think that this still uh, has the possibility of having good therapeutic effects in, in, in vivo. And the other compound here is sototyphin, that is also targeting one of these uh, protein uh, synthesis, uh, prote host proteins involving protein synthesis. And again, it gives us a very nice uh, amount of viral replication reduction. Uh, as well as cytostatic uh, effect. And the same thing, the, the, which is nice, the same thing happens also in, in, in the group in Paris using a different assay, a slightly different assay, a slightly different readout, but still uh, similar data between both and similar also uh, IC50 concentration. Uh, can I have the next one? Uh, so these are some of the, the factors that have been targeted by this drug. So you see here, ternatine 4 is targeting uh, um, protein synthesis at, in, the, in the way of elongation why um, sototyphin is targeting uh, protein synthesis in the way of initiation. And although this is a process that is used also by the whole cell, uh, this factor seems to be more important for the virus and they are probably the ones that are co-opted and they, they are required for high levels of protein, protein biosynthesis. And you can still inhibit these factors without affecting so much the cell and now affecting uh, a lot of virus, virus replication. But there's something that is still we need uh, to look molecularly um, whether actually that's the mechanism of action for these inhibitors. Can I have the next one? All right, so these are the other, uh, th this, this set of drugs that I mentioned before that are targeting uh, these sigma receptors, sigma receptor one and sigma receptor two. They came uh, in, the, in the interactome map, I'm interacting with two of the viral proteins, NSP6 and orf 9 c And almost every single compound that is known to antagonize, that bind and inhibit sigma receptors, is also able to have antiviral activity. And here they are an example of, of multiple of these, uh, of these um, uh, compounds. So what are these sigma receptors? So sigma receptors are not, uh, although they are the target for many multiple drugs, they, the biology is not very well understood. They have to do with the stress signals. Um, but exactly what are they doing in the cell? Uh, why there are so many drugs that are targeting these factors and having a specific, um, they are using for specific conditions like allergy, uh, antihistamines, like uh, neurological conditions, malaria, uh, even hormones like progesterone uh, give us, give us a, a hit in this, uh, antiviral hit in this, in this um, assay. And it's, it's interesting because it's known that uh, women, they have less uh, severe disease than, than men, and we don't know if that's because of progesterone, but that's something that is hypothesis and now can be looked at. 
Uh, so all of these drugs, they have to some extent some impact in viral replication, including hydroxychloroquine, which in addition to inhibit uh, endosomal acidification, is also a target for sigma receptor. And among the drugs that you see here, you see PB28 is one of the, our best drugs in terms of IC50. And this is a, a compound that is in preclinical development and uh, that, we, that we will show some more data uh, about this compound a little bit in the next slide. And here is again uh, Nevan taking over. And uh, Nevan, you now explain how this PB28 works. Okay. I, I, one thing I would just add to this last slide here is uh, this is the power of looking at biology and then going to pharmacology. If you were just look at these chemical structures of these compounds, there's no way you could group these together. But if you knew what the target was, and we think we do, that's how you can group this together. So it's the whole approach is a really data-driven, biologically-based approach in terms of ultimately drug discovery. So as uh, Dolph was talking about, hydroxychloroquine has obviously been in the news. Um, there's been some big clinical trials on this, and, and several have actually been stopped because of toxicity. There's one in Brazil, a big one, that was caught, uh, stopped specifically for cardiotoxicity. And we've been studying the underlying molecular mechanisms behind what is actually hydroxychloroquine doing. So we do find it binding to sigma R1 and R2. These are in vitro binding assays done by a great collaborator, Brian Roth, the University of North Carolina. And, um, but what they saw was that compared to sigma R1 and R2, hydroxychloroquine binds much tighter to HERG, the receptor on the heart. So if you look at some of these other compounds like PB28, like Adolfo was talking about, or Clemenstein, um, this is an antihistamine, you can see in these plots that they're binding much more tightly to sigma R1 and R2 when compared to HERG in comparison to hydroxychloroquine. So we think that the underlying toxicity associated with hydroxychloroquine is connected to the fact that it has a much higher affinity binding to the HERG receptor compared to sigma R1 and R2. And therefore the hypothesis is that some of these other compounds and drugs that we're looking at would not have that same cardiotoxicity. It could have other toxicity issues, but at least it wouldn't have these cardiotoxicity issues. So that's a, a hypothesis that we're continuing um, to test. And um, this is uh, just, again, showing that we're very excited about this preclinical molecule, PB28. This is the TCID50 assay that was done in Adolfo's lab that he told you about. So if you look at the IC90, it's actually uh, 20 times more potent than um, hydroxychloroquine. And this is a compound that's now being put into uh, animal models by Adolfo and his collaborators. And the, the chemists like Kayvon and Brian are looking at this molecule, making tweaks to it to see if we can get it binding more tightly to sigma R1 and R2, and therefore have a more potent antiviral effect um, as well. So all of these compounds and molecules that we were talking about with respect to binding to sigma R1 and R2, they're all considered antagonists in that they bind and they decrease the function of the receptor. And correlative with that, you get antiviral effects. Well, Brian Shoykat called me up one morning and said, look, if this is really the target, if you add an agonist, you should potentially see a proviral effect. And if, if, if in fact, sigma R1 and sigma R2 were being targeted. So an agonist that's well characterized is dectamatorphin. And what we did see here at higher doses is that uh, a seemingly uh, reproducible proviral effect with respect to this dextromethorphan. So we're very excited about this because this helped us, in my opinion, narrow down that, okay, we, these receptors are the key receptors that we should be looking at. But a side effect here, ironically, is that dextromethorphan is in the majority of the over-the-counter cough syrups. Uh, so that's a bit of irony here, obviously, if we're dealing with um, uh, COVID-19. Uh, and uh, what we said here was in the paper, we just wanted to uh, alert people to this finding. It's only done in a laboratory setting. We do not know if this would then translate into proviral effects in humans. More work needs to be done, but we thought we had to report this in a responsible way. But for me, it was a great tool to really narrow in on these receptors. And, and we're going all in on these receptors in, in a number of different ways. And this is another experiment that I thought was pretty uh, cool that Chris White did in Adolfo's lab. So if you remember what Adolfo told you is that we're adding the drugs before infection, but what if we infected and then added the drugs? So this is an experiment that Chris did with three different drugs and compounds where we looked like we did before, we added the drugs before infection, we added the drugs as we infected, and then we um, added the drugs two and four hours post-infection. And it's important to note that we have a much higher MOI in these experiments. And you can see across the board, if you add the drug before or after infection, you see the, still see the same potent antiviral effects. This tells you a number of things, including that uh, we think that these drugs are acting post-entry, which is consistent with the protein-protein interaction map because those interactions are really uh, focused on um, intracellular connections. So I thought this was a very nice experiment.
and then Adolfo is just going to finish off with some. Okay, um, and yes, yes, for finishing up, I have a couple of, of slides. I thought that it would be interesting also for me to show you, which it mainly come from uh, data from uh, my colleague here, Florian Kramer, and we have been helping them in, in virus neutralization assays with his data. So very early on, what uh, Florian Kramer did is he uh, uh, was able to express the coronavirus to, uh, SARS coronavirus to a spike, uh, both in insect cells and in mammalian cells. Uh, and uh, purified uh, from the systems. So having now antigens that can be used for measuring antibody responses. And here I just saw some of the constructs that Both he made. The two minute mark. Yeah, okay, yeah. There are here are some of the constructs that he made. Um, and this this is a, the spike expressed in sex cells here on Comasi blue, or it's present in, in uh, mammalian cells, M spike. There are slightly different uh, molecular weight due to glycosylation, but also the receptor binding domain of the spike expressed very well, both in insect cells and in mammalian cells. And you can have the next slide. Then he has used this uh, complete uh, mammalian express spike purified to try to see whether he can measure antibodies in people that have zero converted to uh, SARS coronavirus 2. And as you can see here, there are samples from uh, multiple samples from uh, SARS coronavirus 2. Uh, and, and you see here expressed in two different ways, but in both, in both ways, either by area under the curve or by the uh, OD in an ELISA assay, uh, you can see that there is a specificity for this assay for finding antibodies in people that have been experienced COVID-2 infections, sars cov 2 infections, while you don't find in negative controls, sera that come from people before the pandemic, or and even sera that come from people that has just been at this time infected and is paused something like two months later with one uh, close coronavirus like the NL63. So this, this now, um, uh, ELISA assay has now been approved by the FDA for emergency use, and it's the only ELISA assay for serology that comes from an academic lab, uh, which uh, testifies to how quickly and, and, and how careful um, uh, Florian is. And not only is able to say yes or no, but it's also able to quantify the number of antibodies that there are in people. Uh, so that, that's quite useful for, for example, setting up convalescent sera uh, treatments as well for following up people that are infected to know what are the levels of antibodies and what is the level of protection that we can find by natural immunity based on levels of antibodies. And my last slide has to do with the correlation that there is between the last assay and macro neutralization, that's what we help, we help in it, and, and that's, that's really good correlation. So high ELISA titers uh, corresponds to high neutralization, and, and lower ELISA titers corresponds to lower uh, neutralization. So we think that this indication also, at least in people that have been infected, uh, a, a, an indication of neutralizing ability in these antibodies, and we also think that this type of measurements will help a lot vaccine development by looking whether we achieve the same levels of antibodies in people that are vaccinated versus people that are infected, and whether these are neutralizing or not. Can I have now? So, so I let you finish here, Neva. Okay. Well, th there's we don't have much time left here. Here's a summary of what we presented, and I just wanted to end here by saying that this was a fantastic collaboration that's been ongoing, not just with scientists in Paris and New York, but scientists in, in England and uh, North Carolina and Seattle and San Diego, and, and really uh, with a number of different uh, companies as well. Um, and just, just to finish here, um, to me, it's been amazing, not just with this collaboration, but you see collaborations around the world about how fast we can move if we all work together. And you see, you've seen silos being broken down across different laboratories, across different inter institutions, and between academia and pharmaceutical companies. And my question is, why can't we do this normally? Uh, so I think what we're doing seeing is a new paradigm of how to do science when we can break down these silos. So the goal is to keep this scientific paradigm in place so that we're in much better position to tackle COVID-22, COVID-24, other pandemics, and just diseases in general. Why aren't we working like this on breast cancer and Parkinson's and Alzheimer's? So to me, this is one of the silver linings of this pandemic is that we can really see what we can get done if we all work together. So this is um, uh, my group. Um, I just wanted to highlight David Gordon here, who led our protein-protein interaction studies, and here's uh, Dolfo's good-looking group as well, and uh, there is um, Chris White here, who's uh, leading a lot of the virological studies. So thank you very much. We'll be happy to take questions. Well, this was one of the most dynamic presentations I've ever witnessed with uh, this uh, back and forth. Uh, terrific work, and uh, we're open for question. Uh, Sagi Shapira? You guys hear me? Yep. Here you, Sagi. Hi, Nevin. Hi, Adolfo. That was awesome. Um, as, as you said, 
it really highlights how important it is to let the biology guide the discovery, therapeutic discovery. So it's really awesome. I, I, I'm curious, you may have mentioned it and I missed it, but um, is uh, loss of function or gain of function of sigma receptor genetically um, result in the same phenotype? That's a, a great question. And, and, and we didn't mention it. <laughs> we didn't mention it, but it's a great question. Yeah. And at the time, the genetics just wasn't there. So we were pharmacologically inhibiting, turning up and turning down, and seeing antiviral and proviral activity, respectively. But what I'll say now is there are genetic tools out there, and uh, we are now using them, and it looks great. So mm -hmm. I think that we have narrowed in on the right receptor. Right. Because as, as you know, as you know, the, uh, often these protein protein interaction maps can be quite misleading in terms of what what genes when knocked down actually result in a phenotype and in fact things that interact directly with the virus are often um, depleted in in things that uh, functionally regulate so it's 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 fantastic that that this led to you know this 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 discovery so i'm, I'm curious to what extent have you done the analysis to look at what it, it, are there any patterns that you see in terms of what things are interacting that also result in some functional consequence on impacting viral life cycle, immune response? Right, as I said, initially we didn't have a genetic tool, so we had to rely on the pharmacology. Um, but now we've done RNAi screen, we're doing CRISPR screens, and there's some awesome. very, very exciting results that we're seeing. And the ones that we've been focusing on pharmacologically are checking out genetically, so we're very awesome. happy about that. And just as an aside, I always thought you'd do the protein-protein interactions and go to genetics, then do structure, then go to drug discovery. But I've learned through this is you can go from protein proteins right to pharmacology. And you can use the pharmacology not just to, to confirm the interactions, but then you have a you can point in a particular direction therapeutically as well. So I don't know why we haven't been doing this all along, but we are going to be doing this going forward, work across all our interaction data. I don't know, Adolfo, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, no, no, no. That's I you you say it well. No. So John Long Wang. John Long. Okay, Andreas Hartel. Hi, thanks for the talks. Uh, fascinating stuff. Um, I was wondering if you can comment on your um, results and your essays um, using the uh, two bromodome domain inhibitors towards the E proteins. The the JQ1 and um, uh, related proteins. There was a. Uh, a fair degree of uh, toxicity uh, seen there. Um, we're tweaking the assays to see if we can see an, an antiviral effect. However, Asaki brought up the genetic experiments look really good in that regard. So genetically, it looks like BRD2 and BRD4 are definitely playing a role. Now the question is, can that be translated into something pharmacologically interesting? So we're working on that right now in Adolfo's group and then also in collaborations in Paris. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, Jahar? Uh, so, um... Uh, and Evan said that um, uh, that uh, uh, this, this is a question for Adolfo actually. Uh, mm -hmm. Nevin said that he, that you are going to try out the test the, the the proteins that's identified by the interactome in animal models. Yeah, and I was track, curious yeah. as to what animal models you were considering, given you know the disappointing uh, uh, the disappointing data from rodents which don't seem to develop ARDS or mortality. Yeah, so, so the animal models, I think is the caveat that they have that, uh, that there is no good animal model for ARDS, but there are still, uh, I think there are still valuable, valuable models for antiviral activity, which uh, not everything that works as an antiviral in tissue culture will be able to achieve antiviral efficacy in vivo. And, and, and because of that, the type of, uh, we are starting using right now a hamster model uh, where the virus replicates and the virus induce some disease based on body weight uh, uh, loss as well in some consolidation in the lungs. It's not a lethal model, it's not an RDS model, but it's a model of viral replication and some type of mild disease. Uh, uh, in addition, we, we will, uh, when the mouse model become more uh, available and the, if there is lethal models, yeah, also something that we we will try, and that's that. And we have also ferret model going. Uh, 
And, and I think also there are some other valuable models for antiviral activity, like macaque models and things like that. Although, again, as you say, earliest models, especially non-human primates, they, they are not existing at this moment. Thank you. John Long, are you ready to ask your question? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, yes. I was curious about the virus interaction with the host translation initiation machinery. I'd offer brief brief mention that uh, the EI4 is as a zootopic thing, but I know I understand that uh, um, the EI4 inhibitor is notorious for a very narrow therapeutic window, and the host translation definitely need those EI4 effect also. So how how would that work out? Play out in terms of the control the virus uh, translation machinery. So, so at the end, it's going to be of how much uh, window there is between uh, between inhibition of protein synthesis between the virus and and the host, and how much important is this for for both toxicity as well as preventing viral replication. One of the good things is that these therapies they don't need to be used chronically, so you just need to use it transiently, and perhaps during these transient uh, effects there is no major side ev events. And, and with the and still, I want to say that. We are some of the inhibitors. We are not completely sure whether they inhibit by protein uh, synthesis inhibition only, because uh, there is notorious also secondary functions of some of these uh, uh, factors, host factors that are involved in protein synthesis, playing a role also in some other uh, uh, biology biological readouts in cells. Maybe one thing I would just add to that particular uh, question is that this sotatafin is from a company called Effector. Some of the co-founders are at UCSF, including Davide Ruggiero and Kevin Shokat. And that drug right now is presently in a clinical trial for uh, multiple myeloma. And that company is now going to is starting a clinical trial with this sotatafin for COVID-19. Yeah, and some of the other one, uh, ternatin, uh, plitidepsin, has, has been approved also for the treatment of cancer in Australia. And is is from a company in Spain, Pharmamar. Uh, it comes from a sea um, 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 uh, creature uh, where they are looking for antivirals in sea creatures, thinking that since they don't have an um, adaptive immune system, they need to have very potent antivirals for uh, for preventing viral infections. And uh, they they have also initiated uh, clinical trials in Spain for the treatment of COVID-19. Thank you. 